I am the most proud American because I do know the difference. In the Soviet Union, you could do one thing or another, but the outcome was always planned for you. To me, freedom is an ability to choose, where the choice is in making decision, reviewing the consequences of it before it's done. Julia Ritchie never really thought about fencing as something she would want to do. She grew up in the Caucasus of the Soviet Union. She was the commander of the shooting squad. She had them lining up to do anything she wanted, but she wanted to be an artist and had started studying art in school. When Julia was 13 and at work camp that summer, she saw fencing for the first time. She didn't even know fencing existed. Every summer, Soviet Union athletes went to 24-day work camps. They spent the days working in the field and were rewarded with sport training and a chance to eat fresh fruit. Julie was captivated by the fencers, but she couldn't justify in her mind girls acting like that, hitting each other and fighting with swords. The fencers were training next to the volleyball players and boxers. Julia was in the volleyball camp. They were fighting and yelling and not being what her righteous mind would accept a girl was. The fencing coach approached me. Well, I can't remember exactly what he said well enough to translate it, but the message was clear. Fencing wasn't about fighting or hitting or yelling. In fact, it was none of the things she was concluding it to be. Fencing was art. From that moment, she was hooked. She was obsessed. While everyone else was out having a good time and being teenagers, she was working targets. She only took private lessons, not fencing anyone for the first three months. She was developing her art. Desire to compete in fence came quickly, and she was determined to be the best foilist. At the time, women were only allowed to compete in foil. Julia left her little hometown to become the best foilist she could be, competing with the top talent of the Soviet Union. She lived and trained at the Olympic Center in Moscow as part of the national team. She didn't have school like normal kids, or boyfriends, or a family life. She had fencing. She had training. She had to work as hard as she possibly could to be a world-class athlete every day. If she didn't want to do it, there were 150 other girls aiming for her spot on the team. In 1989, she earned her Master of Sport. Each Master of Sport has a unique government-issued serial number registered just to them. The pins are made where the medals of the heroes of the Soviet Union were made. Julia began teaching fencing. She had spent most of her life learning this sport, and this sport had spent all of its time teaching her skills for living. She needed to give something back to it. Each of her coaches had given her something. Each had his own piece of the puzzle. She never imagined that one day she would live in America and teach fencing, or that its lessons would one day save her life. To start the best sport, fencing. It's an amazing sport, it's a life skill. And it's also a very safe sport. It's safer than chess. Because when you play chess with me, and you happen to win, you know what I'm gonna do? I'll grab that board, smack you on the head. And then we have masks on, so it's awesome. In the middle of her professional fencing career, Julia got married and had a child, Katya. Since she was a teenager, she knew that's what she had wanted. She planned it. She studied adults, her feelings as a teenage girl, everything, and wrote it down so that when she had a child, she could better explain things to her daughter and understand her. After being at the top as an athlete, she couldn't accept less. But after having a child and health issues, she could no longer do that in foil. She became an epaist, which had just become available to women. She quickly got back on the national team. Katya was her life. Her dreams of Olympic gold were not as important as her life with her daughter. She didn't want her to grow up in the former Soviet Union. Life there wouldn't let them have the values that were important to Julia. When Katya was seven, they emigrated to the United States. She had been told that there was no fencing in America. She certainly couldn't ever remember competing against an American fencer or hearing of one doing very well. She gave all her gear to her club. 
she wouldn't need it where she was going. We arrived two years in 1999. That was the first year when the Sabre became available for women in international level. They lived in Hampton, Virginia for a year before moving to Columbus, Ohio. She got a job at a country club working at the control desk. Club members continued to ask about where she came from. They talked about her degrees in physical sciences and physical therapy. Conversations naturally went to fencing. That's when she discovered that there was fencing in the U.S. They suggested she teach a class. She started small at the country club. As the class grew and she taught what she knew both as a fencer and as a certified personal trainer, she moved away from the control desk to make her life as a fitness professional. Katya and Julia had everything they needed in America. What was better was that Julia could have anything she wanted if she worked for it. She created Royal Arts in 2001. She had her own fencing club. Classes grew. In 2003, she returned to her artistic roots and created a travel trophy for the Arnold Sports Festival. As she walked around the venue as a guest that year, she wondered why fencing was not part of this huge event. I had fenced in more tournaments, in more places and more countries than I could remember. But I'd never ran a tournament. In March of 2004, she organized her first tournament as part of the Arnold Sports Festival. It was one of over 30 sports. There were over 100,000 people walking the venue and seeing fencing, most of them for the first time. Julia's club grew. The Arnold Fencing Classic grew. A problem from her youth also grew. She was told by doctors in Russia that if she didn't quit fencing, eventually she wouldn't be able to walk. She adjusted by wearing braces, stretching, and working to keep her back strong. In 2005, it caught up with her. At the end of a hard week, she was in more pain than usual and more tired than usual. She went to the Whirlpool to relax. She was alone. The pain became so bad, she knew she would pass out. Julia used her last bit of strength pull herself out of the whirlpool. After her surgery, she was in a wheelchair. She lost some students as they felt that it would never be the same again. A few she sent to other clubs because it would be a while before she could do much with them. So she created her own recovery program. She was eventually able to return to her club and her clients and her classes. On January 20th, 2008, Julia was driving home. She was literally at the last light before her house. A drunk woman was racing up behind her, oblivious to the light and the cars in front of her. had very severe trauma to her brain and can't operate. I'm sorry to have to say that the prognosis is doubtful. She's in a coma, but you need to be prepared that she may never recover. They weren't sure how Julia survived, but she would have to take medication for the rest of her life because of that accident. A life she wasn't supposed to have. I believe it was my intense and consistent training that kept me alive. If it wouldn't be for fencing, I'd be dead. Fencing saved my life. There's an old Russian expression. Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. While Julia was at the event, she was unable to walk without assistance, and she was unable to run the event effectively. But her friends, her family, her fencers and their parents pulled the Arnold Fencing Classic together. She lost more students while she was recovering. Julia rebuilt again. In the summer of 2009, Julia was in Dallas for the Summer National Championships. One of her students was fencing in the Division II Women's Foil event. The student hadn't had a very good week. When I walked into the venue that day, I felt that victory was coming. I just knew it. Her flight was scheduled to leave at 7 p.m. When it came time to go to the airport, the event still had a long way to go. She had to make a decision. She missed her plane, and they won a gold medal. 
We saw the large tournaments against the greatest fencers in the world and the amazing victories that I've ever experienced. That one was a lot more. It was harder on me as a coach than fencing ever won, and the reward was a lot greater. In 2010, Royal Arts held the largest Arnold Fencing Classic ever. It was the sixth largest tournament not hosted by the national governing body. It was an unprecedented event with amazing visits from Arnold and Stallone and fencing Olympians. Since the very first Arnold, she had brought in Olympic athletes to give the kids their medals and inspire them. Most of the Olympians have been saberists, but it wasn't until that Arnold that she was inspired inspired with the idea that she could attempt to qualify and fence Sabre at the Summer National Championships in Atlanta. The division qualifier was the first Sabre event she had ever fenced. She started training. Fencing teaches us how to live our lives and sometimes how to save our lives. It gives us the ability to cope with stress, gives us the opportunity to excel. It teaches how to be disciplined and trained, how to negotiate and be patient, how to assert ourselves and ask for what we want. It teaches us how to deal with the bumps in life and how to give. No one is passive about fencing. People who thought it was okay don't fence. Fencers love it. They love to share it. Their worlds revolve around them. Fencing is life. Fencing is freedom. It allows us to choose what we want from it, as long as we accept the consequences. I am the most proud American fencer. <laughs>